This is that Coptic that I, I gave you from Jesus thousands of years ago, which along with identifying 4555, which Debbie has found as the number of a galaxy, and Azozio, which is the crystallized light, we were given this symbol, and we understand that this symbol is also the symbol used by the Astrophysics Department of NASA, the Aeronautical and Space Agency, and it is my belief that the four or the uh, eight circles represent planets. And in as much as the first planet was discovered circling a star in Pegasus, the second one in Virgo, the third Ursa Major, and the fourth in Cancer, we have an announcement to make to you. Uh, from San Francisco, California, Reuters News Agency, Joffrey Marcy and Paul Butler, who discovered the first Two. Two astronomers have discovered a planet 40 light years from Earth. Astronomer Geoffrey Marcy, professor of physics and astronomy at San Francisco University, said on Wednesday that the planet found in the last few weeks was the fifth to be discovered outside the solar system in recent months. So, there's number five. Um, the pro only problem here is we don't know uh, this particular article didn't say in which sign this, this particular planet is located. So that's going to be very important to us. It is 9 million miles from the star known as 3522, which, you know, for no other interest, it adds up to 12, but nonetheless, there it is. Uh, astronomers discovered the planet as part of a 10-year project to make initial <laughs> reconnaissance of planets. Last year, the first such planet was discovered by a team at the Geneva Observatory in Switzerland, and then two were found by Dr. Morrissey and Dr. Butler. Um, so here it is. It, it's number five that we know of, and that would mean if there are truly only three to go, uh, you know, how interesting and how important it is that you use this in your meditation. And I hope that you do, and those of you, when you go into meditation. And I have found that many times, if I just have a few moments, I'll just close my eyes, sit back and say, in, my, in words, in my mind, I see the cross, I see the X upon the cross, I see the eight lines and the circles at the end of each, Azozio 4555. And then, you know, they just keep doing that. What in the world harm can it do? What does it cost you? And yet, how, how can you be part of this if, if you're not plugging in and saying, gee, you know, I want to make sure that these beings, as, as they make their appearances, uh, that when they do ask me these questions, I know of what they're speaking of. And the, the, the situation that we had here the other evening uh, that Al talked about with light entering into this room. And I've thought of all different things. And Al uh, uh, and I talked, uh, Al Bianchi and I talked about all the different other possibilities. Well, there was no lightning that night. And, and the lights were working right and, and nothing flashed and so forth and so on. And uh, everything was fine. But there was this tremendous white light that came into this room. And Al Vero is a very conservative type of person who is not given to any kind of emotionalism. And he, um, he came out and he said that there was six other people sitting here. Did, did anybody see anything? And each person saw this white light. So uh, in as much as we have these things and we, we cherish what we're learning and we cherish the beauty of, of, of what we're seeing and what's happening. But 
the, the important point here is that each one of you, as you step into this new realm of, of understanding, have to at the same time be assured that not only is this right, but that what has always been taught is wrong. And, 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 and you know, if I come and say, well, they're wrong, they're not, they're not right, I'm not, I'm not in any way putting anybody down. If, if, I, if, if you're heading for New York by going south, I'm going to say, you know, there's no reflection on you, I'm not mad at you, you're not a bad person, but you're going the wrong direction. If you turn around, you'll get to New York. And that's all we're saying, and we're saying that yes to Jesus, and yes to the Bible, and yes to all of these things, but under the terms that the Bible itself sets down, and under the terms that Jesus sets down, and not under religious terms, which have, which have, which have totally turned these things upside down and moved away from them. So we're considering a, an activity in your brain, in your mind, and, 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 and one that uh, generates, you know, something out of nothing. And, and, and this is what's exciting about it, because it completely removes us from the realm of, of religion and takes us into this realm of quantum physics, which is an extremely exciting thing. And in quantum physics, it says that the only place where power is found is in emptiness. Where there is nothing is where power originates. So the point being, if you want power to overcome whatever it is in your life that is upsetting you, if you want power to overcome whatever it is in your life that is hindering you physically, mentally, your family, your money, the earth itself, if you want to be plugging into a harmony and really receive this power from what you call God, then you've got to go to emptiness because that's where it originates. And it's not something that you have to have faith in, it's a proven fact. This is a scientific fact that in nothingness is tremendous universal cosmic power. That's why Jesus says, take no thought. Enter into emptiness. In here, in your brain, the point where there is absolutely nothing is the point where all of the energy and power to recreate for you develops. And so it requires you not to pray, not to think, not to say anything, but to find yourself into this black universal hole deep within yourself and then be the recipient of all of this tremendous power. And so where you have uh, to understand these things, you understand how they unfold. A, a, a fellow like David Bohm, this great uh, quantum physicist, compares the mind to the universe both having a structure called empty space. And out of that empty space is where all of this power comes. So you can see the scientific importance of looking where Jesus says from Matthew 6, 25, 33, take no thought, take no thought, take no thought, take no thought, take no thought. Five times he says take no thought. And so you, you've seen this all of your life, but you know, it doesn't mean anything to you because it's in the Bible, it's religious stuff, who cares about that? But now you have to deal with a quantum physicist who says, where you take no thought is where all of this tremendous power develops. Where all of this happens is in a place of absolute emptiness. The awesome power of the universe is contained within you. And that's the creative place, the creative mind. So we look at the relationship between mental, physical. We look at the relationship between matter and energy. And look what we've done. All your life you've gone and you've heard religious talk about body and soul. And you can never deal with anything like this. You sang songs about it, you went to churches about it, but they were untouchable to you. But now all of a sudden you find that body is matter. And soul is energy. And now it, it gets out of the realm of religion, gets into the realm of physics, and now you can deal with it. You can understand it. It becomes rational. You know how you can tell how it works. You can prove, you can prove eternal life. You can prove that you never die by understanding this. I don't mean you can have faith that you never die. You can absolutely prove it. Because you can prove how a nucleus separates into two parts and both parts spin alongside of one another and when one gives out, the other simply splits into two more and they go on forever. That's exactly what happens to you. When the matter dissipates, the energy finds more matter, the energy splits in two and then you keep revolving forever. It has to be that way. It can't be any other way because you're matter and energy. And you can't defy the law of physics any more than you can defy the law of gravity. And so this then becomes an extremely important and wonderful thing. Now this stuff starts to make sense. Now we can understand it. 
Energy gives life to you. But you've got to have a body, matter. Energy must give life to matter so that there's meaning. There has to be a meaning. There has to be a meaning for, for us to even be here. So there has to be energy and there has to be matter. And so all of these things interrelate with one another. And the, the optimum purpose that is as Baum and all of the physicists say, the optimum purpose is what religion has never been able to find. What's the meaning in all of this? And the meaning in all of this is to develop and understand the complexities in a simplistic way that we can do exchanging them here to understand what life is all about, what you are all about, what the world is all about. I have, I, I've seen these people come on television and they rant and they rave about their savior and yet they're knocking the hell out of one another all over the place forever, the world. And then you find suddenly that we're, we're plugged into a religion that has its roots and has its scientific basis from the dark ages of the middle ages of Europe. So it doesn't, it doesn't work anymore in 1996. So physics teaches us where we've made a terrible mistake. Out of emptiness, out of nothing, is constantly springing forth this new energy. Out of emptiness, out of nothingness, is constantly springing forth this new understanding, this new natural meaning. And then, this is what the physicist says, energy becomes crystallized into matter. In other words, the word was made flesh. Energy is crystallized into matter. Energy, when it is crystallized, light, when it is crystallized, becomes something physical. Something changes. And the crystallization of light, changing energy into matter, is a zozio. And a zozio is part of the key that I gave you, and that's exactly what it means. Light that is crystallized. And remember, physics, understand physics. When you crystallize light, it becomes something physical becomes something you can feel, becomes something you can see. Right. And you can't, you can't just simply walk around anymore and as you start to understand this and not have some degree of curiosity about what's going on. What is this all about? What is, what is your life about? Now, now you get to the point where you can leave religion. Jesus, close these church doors and get away from them because they cause nothing but horror and violence and scaring the heck out of people and scaring children. I, you know, so all these places, they got these drug rehabilitation centers and all of this thing going on and all of this violence. And then you look at them taking kids into, into schools and Sunday schools and teaching them all of this fear and all of this guilt and all of these devils and demons and all of this stuff that doesn't exist. That is the understanding of the Dark Ages. If a person had muscular dystrophy not that long ago, they were considered insane because we were ignorant. And people weren't able to, to rationalize. I mean, even in this country, you know what the most disgusting thing is? They have white churches and black churches. What, the, what is that? How can it be a God that they worship and they got a black church and a white church? It's people. They, we've never even been able to arrive at the conclusion that it's just people. It's not somebody. It's not a starving baby in, in, in Africa. It's a starving baby. Period. It doesn't make any difference. But we've never been able to move beyond that because of this damnable thing called religion, which has separated people, frightened people, and had you singing your way into oblivion. Let's get up and sing the song, children. Let's sing the song. And we sit down, we haven't a clue, and the whole world is going by totally out of our reach because all we do is sing the song, put the money in, and say, hallelujah, I'm saved. For <laughs> so the new message then the new meaning is that of emptiness see here we take everything that we've ever learned everything that we've ever thought everything that we've ever heard and the board is clean it is absolutely empty and now the creative forces can bring into us all that is new once we're ready to let it all go but religion says when we open our minds to this wonder, we open our minds to demons, we open our minds to devil. When we meditate on nothingness, they say, this, this, you, 
can't do that. You're opening your minds to all of these horrible things. They become the obstruction to the creation of this new power. I am sick of people dropping bombs on each other. I am sick of the torture of animals, sick of the torture of the earth, sick of the torture of children, sick of the degrading of women, sick of the degrading of people who may think differently than you think by these damnable organizations all over the world called religion. And yet, I am so happy that the beings who are descending upon the earth have no religion. They don't belong to any of that stuff. They belong to the universe. And I would like you to join a new denomination, which not too many people have ever joined. And it's the denomination of being a human being. Just being a person. A human being. And so here then, we know that we have to enter within ourselves, recreate ourselves from within through the emptiness, which the physicist tells us is the creative point of all power and all understanding and all healing. I'm telling you something. Is your business a little shaky? Is your house a little shaky? Is your health a little shaky? Are your kids a little shaky? Are you a little shaky? Are you reading a Bible and you don't have a clue what the heck that thing is saying because you're leading, reading it literally? You know? But if you have all of these things, then you enter into this place of the creative force, and when you separate from the thoughts of your mind, I don't tell you this, Jesus doesn't tell you this, but an Albert Einstein and a David Baum and all the quantum physicists say, if you empty, enter into that emptiness where there is absolutely no thought, out of that place will develop from within you tremendous power which will turn everything upside down and all of the junk that you've had to put up with is gone. And it's a scientific fact how it happens. So what's necessary? A change of meaning is necessary to change the world. But the change has to begin with you. And now let's look at the words of the Jesus that's on the bumper stickers. Honk if you love Jesus. Honk, bah, 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 I love Jesus. Do all of these things. But uh, you know, one thing they don't tell you about Jesus, they never say to you, do what the guy said to do. Don't do that. Honk. Just honk. Sign a card and honk. Honk, honk. Sign a card, but don't do what the guy said. Because let me show you what he said. Go to page 847. And on page 847, he's talking to the lawyers. And the lawyers of the time are those people who interpret the law, who interpret the Bible, who tell you what you should do in order to be in with God. Page 847. Luke chapter 11, and look at verse 52. Woe unto you, lawyers, you have taken away the key of knowledge. When you came in here that night, those of you who have chosen to do this, what did I give you? The key. I gave you the key. I proved to you the scientific expertise of the people who gave that key thousands of years ago, and I gave you that key. I proved to you every part of the key has a scientific documented proof in 1996 even though it was given 3,000 years ago and I gave you that key and here in Luke 11:52, he says you have taken away the key of knowledge how come you entered not in yourselves and them that were entering in you hindered and they do it to this day you go to any church up or down this road and say you go into yourself and you separate from thoughts they'll tell you it's evil and stop doing it it's a cult, and you're going to open your mind to devils and all this stuff, so they become an obstructor. Once God and salvation have a different meaning, then a fundamental change can take place. And before we move on, and I will introduce you to things, I will, I've already introduced you to things that you've never heard before, and I'm going to introduce you to many things that never got, and I'm going to introduce you to people that you could never even conceive that you could have ever met before, right here in this room. Right here, right here in this room, right in this very place. <laughs> you think I'm kidding? I know you do. But you should know me better than that. Because I never told you anything that didn't happen. And some of the times when I come off the stage, I say, why'd you say that? And I don't know why I said that, except that it happens. So I will show you, and I will introduce you, and you will meet people that I know, and you're gonna know. Okay. Now. This is what Buddha said. Buddha said, I have shown you the way to liberation. Now you must take it for yourself. But you know, how hard is it? How hard is it? Your whole life, you're beating your head, you're 
bang, running your head in against the wall. And then next week, boom, bang, and you're running your head in. Every week you're running your head in. And you're okay today. You're here. Look at you. Look very calm. What about yesterday when you were running your head against the wall? Or last week? Or when you were screaming or throwing something at somebody? Or whatever you do. And it never stops. It never, and that's part of it. That's part of the fun. I don't want to take that away. But I enjoy doing that, though. I love to sulk. I love to, I like to go in my room, close the door, I'm sulking. I'll come out when I want to come out. When I'm done with my sulk, I'll come out. You know, and I understand all of that stuff. But there is a fundamental change that we can overcome. Not this, because that's the fun part. But overcome the fact that we dwell and live in these things. And they affect your business, and they affect your life. They affect your health. They affect your home. We can overcome that by understanding this. And this is why Buddha says, hey, I've shown you the way. Now you've got to take it for yourself. If this is too, if it's too much of a struggle for you to come here and understand this stuff, there's nothing I can do about it. And it's none of my business. I don't know where you live. I don't know what your address is, your phone number. I don't want to know. It is none of my business. You know? The only telephone numbers I know is the Chinese restaurant. <laughs> and I don't, want, I don't care about anybody's phone number. You know? I don't want you knowing mine either. <laughs> You do your thing, I'll do mine, and that's, not, that's it. I never said, oh, you, you didn't come here? Did I call you up and say, where have you been? Did I say, when you come through the door, where have you been? It's none of my business with you. But it is your business, and I'll show you why. Go to page 782. And in Matthew chapter 7, verse, you know, you know, you, you know since there are people that, there's some people, and it's, it's been said many times, Many ways, many times. <laughs> now, it's been said many times uh, <laughs> that uh, this is a cult. All right. And you know, you know, you, you, know the, the, you know the one thing that I made sure of when we started this, and you know this, sir. It will have no members. There is no membership. Nobody joins because I knew the stuff that I was going to be telling people. The first thing people up there are going to say, it's a cult. You cannot have a cult without members. And we have no members. You couldn't even join this place if you wanted to. I don't even belong to this place. What am I doing here? I don't even belong to it. Nobody knows. This is wild. There's no, nobody, who wants to take responsibility for this? Are you kidding? No, I don't. Who's in charge? Nobody. Who comes here? Nobody. We don't know. How can you be a cult? How can you be, I don't even know where you live. Where, I don't, see, so there's no cult. All the cults are up there, and they're saying we're a cult. And the only church that can't qualify as a cult because we don't have any members is this. <laughs> is this great or what? Do we know what we're doing? Okay. All right. So this is what Jesus says, Matthew chapter 7, verse 14. Straight, that word straight, did you ever hear like the straits of Panama? The straight, it means a narrow place. Straight is the way, the straight is the gate. Narrow is the way which leads to life. And few there be who find it. And you shouldn't be among those because you know about it. You know a lot more than the average person does. Now, let us get and start to break down these things so we can move on and get to the light beings and, and, and do the things that, exciting things that you want to do. But before we do that, for those of you who come here, and I share this with you, it's up to you to understand these things. Let's define this word that you hear all the time on television, salvation. You know, you've got to be saved. You know, you hear people say, I was saved when I was five years old. Can you imagine such nonsense? I was five years old, I was saved. To be saved from what? What are you going to be saved from? Religion suggests that you are to be saved from hell. Okay? Saved from hell. Now you have to consider in your adult mind, do you even want to hang around with somebody called God? who sends people into a pit of fire, burning them forever, with demons sticking forks in you to see if you're done and the rump roast is ready. <laughs> forever! Do you want to hang out with this? Is this kind of a guy you want to live next door at your mansion to this guy? What kind of a sadist is this character? You want to live? You want to go to heaven? Oh, I'm living next door. I'm living next door to the guy that's got billions of people in this pit with demons sticking in with pitchforks while they're on fire forever because they went to Atlantic City. <laughs> I don't think so.
Could there be a place like this somewhere in the universe? Hardly. I mean, you know, for God's sakes, this is the worst barbaric type of paganism, superstitious, and yet this is the basic foundation of your culture. You teach your kids this and you wonder why they're all stoned. <laughs> this is what your plans are for their future. You're going to go to hell, Gerard. I saw you eat that old Henry boy. You're going to hell. Why is he going to be? You know, and, 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 you know, do you know what happens then? Kids suddenly start saying, this is nuts. And they don't believe this any more than they believe Santa Claus. And they don't believe you. And they know you're a liar. And they know that they're living with a bunch of liars in the house. Obviously. Now, there are some clues. Let's go to Scandinavia cold place, Scandinavia. Comes the myth of the place of the underworld where people are sent to learn. You go and you have a book with you and you sit and you learn and you read and you understand and you begin to realize the errors of your ways and then you leave. And the name of this place in Scandinavia is hell. H-E-L. Our religion teaches us that this, this horrible place. Now, the funny thing about this, you need a coat there because it's cold in Scandinavia. So when you go to hell, you've got to bring your woolies and your long johns and your socks and everything and sit in hell and then you've got to learn. We got it and we make this place where you get, we are on fire and they stick you with pitchforks. Now, this is the point. Have you not heard... Have you not been told, have you not learned that once you go to hell, you are there forever? You are, there's no getting out of hell. There's no way out. It's forever. You went to Atlantic City, now you're going to hell forever. And you lost your money in Atlantic City at the same time. It doesn't make, there's a no-win situation. You're going to hell forever, you lost 50 bucks in Atlantic City. What kind of deal is this? <sighs> Look at, look, I forget, I don't know what page this is on. Somebody tell me, Proverbs uh, 15. Go to, tell me what page that's on so you can, somebody else can find this. Proverbs chapter 15. 552? Yes. All right, go to page 552. Now let's look because I want you, why is it important that I'm showing you this? Because you can't walk around and tell the fundamentalist crowd that oh, this, they should meditate. You've got to be able to show people, look, I'll show you, I'll prove to you. First thing, they're in fear of hell. They're in fear that they're going to go to hell forever and that there's no way out of hell. Okay? You've got to be able to show, that's not true. That was told to you so that you, know, you could be held in kind of a, a bondage to the systems. Proverbs chapter 15, look at verse 24. With me, the way of life is above to the wise, that he may depart from hell beneath. Write that one down. Wait a minute. You can get out of hell. This, how long have you waited to find that out? Forget light beings and pegasus. This is a big, you can get out of hell. The way of life is above to the wise, that he may depart from hell beneath. So we have this statement in the Bible that we can depart from hell. And what is departing from hell? Salvation. What, it is de what does it depend on? Finding the way that is above. I don't think you're on the camera. Is because I'm walking over here. <laughs> I, Look, this was really important. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Sometimes you say some really good things. <laughs> okay. But, but now, the, the point here is that salvation depends on finding the way that is above. And when you find the way that is above, and what we understand this means, when you rise into a higher realm of consciousness, you depart from hell. Which, which, what, what is it that is your hell? Just think about it. Is it yourself? Is it your health? Is it your family? Is it your business? What is it? It's hell. I can tell you something. 
If you've got a bad toothache and it's infected and they've just declared war, the third world war, you don't care. <laughs> you don't even watch on TV because you've got a toothache. It depends on what's burning you that is the hell. I don't care. I got this. I go to a doctor. Let them blow the place up. I don't really care. <laughs> and so we understand something. that As we rise into this place above, we depart from the hell that is beneath them. That's what hell. And it's in the Bible. This is what I want you to be able to see. So all of the years that you've been taught that hell is a place where you stay forever, the Bible says, that's not true. But why didn't you... Fundamentalist teachers tell you that's not true because they want you always to be subjected to that fear. Because as long as you're subjected to that fear, then they're the ones that will save you. But remember when their salvation comes. Remember when you get your goodies. When? After you're dead. Great deal. Is this great or what? <laughs> Let's sing another song, Glory to God. Pass the plate. After we're dead, we're all going to have a heck of a time. Got to spend a little time in, not hell, but a purgatory. Then we'll, we'll, we'll construct a place, and then we'll all go and we'll all sing a song. Where? Where's all this going to happen? In heaven. Where's that? It's a place somewhere. Where? I don't know where. But give us some money. And you know what the point is? They pack them in. <laughs> Let's sing Amazing Grace. What a wretch am I. Boy, am I a wretch. And we're all going to go and die, and then we're going to So I got a deal for each one of you sitting here. It's a terrific deal. I'll get you, promise now, no doubt about it, a 1997 Cadillac four-door. Fully loaded, bar, TV, the whole bit. Everything electronic. You just pay me $20 a month. Each one of you pay 20 bucks a month, 1997 Cadillac, and you pick it up the day after you die. <laughs> Come on, folks. But you know what? Comes to church, you think it's a great deal. You wouldn't miss it, right? They're packed. They want to pick up their car after they die. <laughs> Jesus said, broad is the way to destruction, narrow is the way to life, and few there are that find it. Now, religion tells us that Jesus is the way, and that salvation comes from accepting Jesus as Lord and believing that God raised him from the dead. Now, that is all that's required according to the fundamentalists. That's all you have to do. You confess Jesus is Lord. I confess that Jesus is the Lord of my life. I believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. You do that, you are saved. You sign a card, it doesn't make any difference how scuzzy you are for the rest of your life. You can beat up kids, kick cats, do whatever you want to do. Your name is written in the book of life, and you're going to heaven. And this is wonderful. Now, <coughs> let me show you where that comes from. We have to understand these things if you're going to move into a higher realm, and, and, and a lot of us don't understand that. Go to page 926. And if you look at page 926 and you look at the book of Romans, Romans chapter 10, this is written by a guy named Paul, that you call Paul, whose actual name was Apollonius. He was, was a Greek, you know. And uh, anyhow, Romans chapter 10, and if you look at verse 9, what does it say? If you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, you see that? And shall believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That's all you got to do. Nothing else is, in, it is not necessary to do anything else. Confess with, and you know, churches are built on this and they pack them in. Why? This is a great deal. And I don't know anything. See, once you get people that are absolutely ignorant, have no idea what's going on, then this is a great deal. All I got to do is say that. I mean, all I got to do is say this, and then I'm going to heaven, you know. So nobody knows, so, so why not? I'll say it. This is the scripture that is the basis of the born again fundamentalist movement. So you're told to believe that Jesus was physically raised from the dead. Go to page 942. You're in 926. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the same guy that told you that if you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved, has said something else in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look at verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. Which means that you put a body into a grave, zip, it comes up as a spirit. 
What he just told you here is that there is no such thing as the resurrection of a dead body. And do you know what? You know doggone well there is no such thing as the resurrection of a dead body. It doesn't happen that way. You're on page 942, you're at 1 Corinthians 15, chapter 42. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50. Flesh and blood cannot, cannot inherit the kingdom, neither does corruption inherit incorruption. The human body which is subject to corruption can never, ever, ever inherit that which is in corruption. It is impossible. So here's the same guy that told you, on one hand you're told that Jesus physically was raised from the dead, on the other hand you're told this is impossible. And you know that it's not possible. You know this is a story of the Son. You know that the sun goes through the cross. You know that the sun is entombed in the winter solstice. You know that the sun resurrects back up to the Father and sits at the right hand of power. And the sun becomes the lamb that takes away the cold of the winter. For God's sakes, you know what this is. Why do you have summertime? Why can you go on to the swimming in, the, in your, your, your vacation? Why You were camping last week. How come you can go camping? How come you can go out and do all the things you like to do? You know why it's nice out now? You know why there's flowers out now? You know why birds are chirping now? Because God's only son came down and went through the cross on December 21st. That's why. Otherwise, it couldn't have happened. And then God's only son sat in the winter solstice three days and three nights in the bowels of the earth. And on December the 25th, by the trajectory of the earth, God's only begotten son, the light of the world, was born again. Thirty years after he was born, Jesus entered into the water of the water man, John the Baptist. Thirty days after December the 25th, the sun enters into the sign of the water man, Aquarius. Jesus then went on to select his disciples from the fishermen. The sun goes into the constellation Pisces, the fish. Jesus becomes the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. The sun enters the Lamb, Aries, and takes away the cold of the winter, and we pass over. Jesus sat at the right hand of the Father. The sun moves in the eastern sky in the northern hemisphere to sit at the right side of power and summertime comes. It is a story of the sun. And yet we have twisted this thing into a point where they say, you've got to believe that a man got out of a grave in order to be saved. And did you ever think of this? There was a guy named Nicodemus. Remember Nick? Jewish guy? <laughs> Nick had all, of the, he had all of this religious stuff on him. What did Nick do? He comes up to Jesus and he said, excuse me, yeah, uh, fella, you're going around town. Let me ask you a question. How do I get saved? You know what Jesus said to me? You've got to be born again. How could Nick believe that Jesus was raised from the dead if he wasn't dead? I mean, how could Nick say, I confess that you are dead and raised from the dead if Jesus hadn't died yet? He couldn't. He couldn't. And Jesus himself said in Mark 4.11, all of these things are done in parables. All of the gods, Dionysius, Osiris, Mithra, Adonis, they're all resurrected gods. They all were placed in the tomb, and they all resurrect at the time of the spring equinox, at the time of Passover. All of the gods resurrected. All of the gods come to the earth, and all of them are sun gods, and all of them appear in new forms. Modern physics has demonstrated that the seed of the atom contains within itself the Promethean life of fire. Do you know what Prometheus you know Prometheus is? Prometheus, and the word actually means forethought. Well, Prometheus is part of, uh, of a uh, myth, and he stole the fire from the gods and gave it to human beings, along with all the arts and civilizations. He was regard regarded as the creator of man. But what Prometheus did, this is the mind. This is thought. And he actually became a latter Adam. He gave, in other words, he took what he shouldn't have taken and he gave it to us. And so in order to compensate, because this Prometheus had done this. You remember Adam, you know, he ate the tree and became like, like God and all of these things. Well, Prometheus was doing the same thing, only he was giving all the good stuff to the people. And so God sent a woman to screw it up. <laughs> and you know who she is. You know who this woman is. 
Yes, you do. You know her very well. Her name is Pandora. And, and Pandora had this little box. And what did God say to Eve? See, all these trees can have anyone you want, but don't eat that tree. Which tree? There's 60 billion trees. Oh, I'll show you the one that you can't eat from. Here's 59,999,000,000. You can have it. But you see this one here? Don't touch that one. That's like telling you to close your eyes and don't think of elephants. <laughs> So, of course, when you say, look, you can have anything you want, Pandy, but whatever you do, don't open the box. And here's the box. <laughs> and it's not locked. <laughs> so, Pandora was uh, basically the first woman, and she was given a gift that all of our ladies have. Curious. <laughs> so Pandy said, oh, I want to be, I want to be good with the Lord. Praise God and all his holiness. God bless him. I have the box. And I, I'm just going to take a fucking peek. And she opened the box and all help came out of there. All the garbage in the world. And only one thing stayed in that box. And she closed the lid. And one thing stayed in the box. Hope. All the garbage in the world was spilled out on humankind, but there was one thing that stayed. Hope. Possibilities. There's always this possibility. Prometheus, Prometheus was one of the Titans, and one of the Titans are the 12 offsprings of Uranus. Uranus married Gaia, and they had 12, and one of the 12 was Prometheus. And Uranus means heaven, the kingdom of Uranus. See, this is what's so exciting. In the Bible, it's written in Greek. The Greek word for heaven is Uranus. And in the Bible, Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is at hand, it means the kingdom of Uranus is at hand. And right now, as you look up into the sky in the Aquarian age, Uranus has become the controlling and dominating influence and dominating planet and so forth and so on. But you see, what happens here is that Prometheus, for doing these horrible things and stealing from the gods, is chained to a mountain. And birds come and eat his liver every night. <laughs> yes. And then they go away, and as the liver regenerates itself, they come back the next day and eat the liver again. And what are the birds, the thoughts? And the thoughts that eat away at that part which is supposed to filter out for us all of the waste and all of the horror. And it's destroyed by our thoughts. See? The liver becomes a sieve. And it filters out all of the impurities. What learned, word have you learned recently that says all of the impurities will be filtered out? Azozio. 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 See? So that's what happens. A lot of people have taken this story and said that the, you know who's considered a latter-day Prometheus was Frankenstein, a story written by Mary Shelley when you breathe life into dead flesh, but it turns evil. So anyhow, resurrection is portrayed then not as something that raises a dead physical body, but something that raises a dead physical soul, a dead physical spirit. And so we begin then to understand that. And how can we further prove that? And we proved it to you by the point where Jesus tells Nicodemus, you've got to be born again. But how could he possibly accept Jesus' death? He couldn't. And how could you say, you're going to receive Jesus as Lord? Wait, you know, how, have you ever done that in a, in, a, in, a, in a religious service? Have you ever said, expressed that you received Jesus as Lord? If you've done that, you've got to confront with something. Open the Bible to page 869. 
We'll be done in a second. Look at John chapter 5. And in John chapter 5, I want you to look at what Jesus says in, in verse 30. John chapter 5, verse 30. What does Jesus say? He says, of my own self, I can do nothing. How could Nicodemus accept him as Lord if he could do nothing? Paul says a physical body can't resurrect from the dead. Jesus tells Nicodemus, you got to be born again, but Jesus is still alive. So this takes us away from the point of religious formation of salvation. I, and I know you've been here a long time, and I know you're, you're restless and you, you want to get out, but just give me a couple more minutes and then we're out of here. Because I've got to just tell you this one thing. Because we've addressed this part of salvation. Because <clears throat> I want to get on to the to the part with, with the light beings and, and next week and we want to start that. But I gotta I just want you just to bear with me for a minute and then we'll go out and we'll get over the rest of it. This is the second part. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Basically what people do in church is they ask God to send Jesus into their heart. If Jesus, confessing Jesus as Lord, in other words, if you simply say, I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord of my life. All right? That's what the rules are. That's what you have to do. First of all, we found out you're supposed to believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, but we have Paul's words that dead people don't get out of graves. So we have to deal with that. I mean, you can say, well, that didn't mean, but that's what it says. If, it's, if it didn't mean that, it shouldn't be in there. That's what he says. So obviously, when you have a conflict in thought like that, raise... No, then you have to say, well, what does it really mean? Whenever you see something in the Bible or in any type of literature where it says yes to one thing, but it says no to the same thing, then you look for middle ground. What the heck is it talking about? And then you find out that it has a symbolic meaning, which this resurrection does. The second thing, you confess Jesus for Lord. Now, the Bible, according to the fundamentalists, that's all you have to do to get salvation. If you confess Jesus as Lord. Now, to go to page 979. And in 979, you come to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 5. And you have to deal with this. Because this is what's important. These people out there, I don't care whether you're into this. I don't care whether you do this type of new age stuff or that type of new age stuff. All this stuff, you can blow it away. It means absolutely nothing because people have been doing it for 200 years and the world's still a mess. The point now is to wait and touch these beings of light and transform this whole thing into a revolution of Aquarius. This is all that matters anymore. And so, but the point is, you'll never be able to sit down when the time comes to talk to these people and explain why it's wrong what they're doing unless you show them. If they say all you've got to do is confess with your mouth and believe with your mind, then you have to show them page 979, the book of Hebrews, chapter 5, verse 9, and read it with me. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all of them that obey him. Where did he ever say that? Where did Pastor Hagee ever say that you had to do what Jesus said to do? Where did they ever tell you that in your church, that you had to obey and do what he said to do? Where did they ever say that? And so I am in no way coming against Jesus. I am in no way coming against the Bible, just the opposite. I am saying, yes, Jesus has to be your Lord. Yes, that you have to obey the Bible. But yes, you have to do what it says to do. You can't do what the Methodists or the Baptists or the Catholics or any of them say to do because they don't say that. They say, obey us. And so what does he say? And you can honk if Jesus is Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Jesus is Lord. Hallelujah. Raise your hands if Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. <laughs> but go to page 838. Go to page 838. And what does he say? In Luke chapter 6. And look what he says in verse 46. Page 838. Luke chapter 6. Verse 46. And why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things that I say? What good is it? 
What good is it going to your church? What good is it that you show up every Sunday morning? What good is it you go to Bible study? What good is it that you say you're saved? Because can you confront yourself with this? What do you do? You do the same thing that they would do. They stare at me. Because their allegiance is to an institution. They're part of a cult. They're part of the group. They don't dare disagree with it. But he said, well, what are you calling me, Lord? Go to page 881, John chapter 15. Just bear with me, just, just for a couple more minutes, because I, and then I'm done. John chapter 15. What does he say in verse 14? He says in John chapter 15, verse 14, You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. So now you get catapulted out of religion and the religious formula of confess and believe. You're catapulted into the mind. You can't believe in a physical resurrection because Paul says it doesn't happen. You can't believe in simply saying Jesus said so. I believe it because Jesus says that won't do. So now what are you going to do? And this is where you've got to talk to these people and you've got to have the courage to sit down and show these people. A relationship with Jesus is obedience. It's not going to say, Jesus is Lord. The Lord is not the way of religion. It, is, it says confess Him as Lord. It says nothing about obedience. But you've seen the Scriptures yourself. And why don't they obey? Why don't they do what they're told to do? Because the scripture says, for grace you are saved through faith and not of works. So they say, well, but see, I can't do anything. I don't have to do anything. So they take this position. Now, did each one of you see where Jesus said, why do you call me Lord and not do the things I tell you to do? Did you see that with your own eyes? Then ask him. Ask him. You want salvation? Ask him. What the heck should I do? He said, why do you call me Lord and not do what I tell you to do? Now he's saying, you say to him, and you've got the right to say to him because it's your skin, what should I do? What should I do? And he says, first, 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 before you do anything, before you find a Bible-believing church, before you find a pastor, before you find a Bible, before you find religion, before you get involved with anything in the world, the first thing that you must do, and remember, this qualifies you that you are following Him as Lord if you obey Him. The first thing you've got to do, page 782. Matthew chapter 6. Okay? Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Seek first the kingdom of God. And all of these other things that are bothering your head, that are bothering your stomach, that are bothering your kids, that are bothering your family, that are bothering this earth, seek first the kingdom of God, and all of these things will be given to you. So now you can say, okay, you're the Lord. You're in charge. I'm going to do this. I'm going to look before I do anything else, I'm going to look for this kingdom. Now you've got a right to ask this guy, where the heck is it? Where am I going to look? And go to page 853. And in page 853, he says to you, they're going to say it's here, they're going to say it's there, they're going to say it's everywhere. But in page 853, Luke chapter 17, verse 21, he said, the kingdom of God is within you. What did the man say? You want him to be your Lord? You want to be saved? What did he say? Before you do anything else, Gloria, look within yourself. Don't bother with anything else. Ursula, look within yourself before you do anything. Hey, I can follow a guy like that. All right, I can now confess that Jesus is Lord. Why? Because I do what the guy says to do. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. I don't know how to do that. Charles, ask him. Jesus, you said that if you're Lord, we got to... First thing we got to do is look within ourselves. Then we'll get salvation. That's right. Look within yourself. Search within yourself for the kingdom. How do I do that? How do I do that? How do I do that? You there? Matthew 6. Matthew 6, 
All right? Page 781. Matthew 6. Matthew 6. Matthew 6. Verse 781. You there? Verse 22. The light of the body is the eye. If your eye be single, your whole body shall fill with light. In other words, practice the single eye. Stimulate the pineal gland of the brain. Let the energy rise from the solar plexus up to the pineal gland, which will throw open the right hemisphere of the brain. This is how you do it. Wait a minute. In other words, I seek within myself. I'm looking for the kingdom. I do this before I do anything else. I don't get involved in any churches. Don't join any churches. Don't join any Bible-believing churches. Don't get involved in any pastors, any religions. Don't give any money to anybody. First thing I do is look within myself for the kingdom, and I practice the single eye, which means stimulate the pineal gland of the brain. And then what happens? You're in 622. Go three verses to 625. Now, you have to change the page. 622. Go to 625. You have to do it. What does he say? 625, take no thought, go into emptiness. Verse 27, take no thought, go into emptiness. Verse 28, take no thought, go into emptiness. Verse 31, take no thought, go into emptiness. Verse 34, take no thought, go into emptiness. Take no thought for your life. Take no thought for your business. Take no thought for your health. Take no thought for your kids. Take no thought for your animals. Take no thought for the world. Take no thought for nature. In other words, Enter into emptiness and allow the physics, God's universal law of physics, to explode within you the creative power of Christ, the creative power of the universe that comes out of nothingness, that comes out of emptiness. And then you can truly walk up the stairs of this building and say, I have confessed Jesus as Lord and I have backed it up because I obey and I do exactly what he said to do. I enter, I seek first the kingdom which is within me, I practice the single eye, I separate from the thoughts and I rise into the bosom of Holy Mother, Pia Mater, and I now know that I am saved out of the hell which is below because I have departed to that from that to the heaven which is beneath, and now I become one with the light beings of the universe to make a change, to make a quantum change. And all the things of life shall be added unto you. Now, you can either say they're right because they have said what he did not say, or you could say, I and my family will follow him. He's right. And he has instructed us specifically and clearly what we should do. And he has promised us that if we do that, all of the wonders of the universe will explode into activity in our life. And then he said, when you're one of his, and you are by doing what he said, then he said, you'll know that when all of these things start happening in the sky, when you see the movement of strange things, planets that have never happened before, and you're seeing it now, and they found the fifth, then look up for your redemption. You're going to swap in, just like you go to the redemption booth at Trump Plaza. You're going to swap in your old, dirty things for some good clean cash. You're going to swap in all the junk for all the good stuff. Your redemption is at hand. Now you're part of him. Now you understand him. Now you can really say, I'm following this guy. He is Lord of my life. I'm doing exactly what he says and I'm not letting any religion or any cult get in my way or stand between me and the Christ. Now you're part of the quantum. Now you're part of the universe. And now you know why he said when you see the man with the pitcher of water, wow! We're going to have a Passover like you've never seen before. <clears throat> this is life. This is love. This is creation. This is cosmic universal oneness. And this is the time when we can get to the point of introducing you to the people with the light in their hands. Do you understand what I said? You feel confident with what you saw? You understand what you saw? Do you understand the difference between the way they describe Jesus as Lord and what he said and how he is lined up totally with you? and why he had to run to the mountains whenever the crowds came, like running up to Ursula's upper room. If you haven't ever gone to Ursula's upper room, you should. Good night. We'll see you. Bye-bye. Have you ever dreamed about living in glorious harmony with nature?